Um, so I'm Zach Brown. I work for Microsoft as a senior software engineer on Office 365. And we're going to talk about ETW, which seems to be something that people have either heard of but don't know anything about it, or they are interested but have no idea how to start because the docs are atrocious. Um, so we'll start with a story. Um, this is a little snip of a 4688 event, which is a process start in the Windows security event log. Um, anyone who does Windows security has probably seen this before and looked at it. It's probably the most common event people look at. Um, and so that first highlighted line is you can see bad.exe has executed. And its parent process was, oh no, w3wp, which is IIS. So somebody's hacked your web app. Um, problem is, we saw it run. And then it, the, the process exited a couple hours later. Then we got on the box. And bad.exe was gone. We don't know anything about it. Um, we might be able to figure out who created the file um, using some uh, file, file system forensics. Um, but we don't really know what that was, where it came from. We don't have any information. We don't understand what it did. Um, so if we were to build a forensics wish list, um, what would we want? Right? So we'd want to know some things about networking. Um, so things like what DNS lookups did it perform? What IP addresses did it connect to? Um, how much data was transmitted, whether it's beaconing, so talking to, to command and control infrastructure. Um, and then maybe some things more about what it did as opposed to who it talked to. Um, so what DLLs it loaded? Um, did it create any threads in any in other processes, you know, process hollowing? Um, any WMI operations for persistence? And then did it call any PowerShell functions, right? You can, you can host the PowerShell runtime in another process if you know what you're doing. Um, and you don't need PowerShell.exe. You just need the system.automation.dll. So what if I told you you could get all this information? And it's already there. You don't have to write any like telemetry into the OS itself. It's all just part of the OS. And what if I told you you didn't need a kernel driver either? Um, so ETW, to the rescue, stands for Event Tracing for Windows. Um, it's originally for debug scenarios, so things like performance and power management tracing and CLR behaviors. Um, but it also happens to have a huge amount of information on a lot of different subsystems. Um, things like network, so send and receive and connect, um, process creations, thread creations, memory allocations of various sorts, and whether or not they set the read write executable flags on, the uh, on that section of memory. Image load, which in parlance for Windows is loading a DLL. DLLs are called images. Um, and then on the user mode side, for all those subsystems I alluded to, PowerShell has, a, has an ETW trace. WinINet has an ETW trace. So you can see things like unencrypted request and response headers um, from HTTP or HTTPS. Um, WMI, WinRM, which is the remoting technology for PowerShell, and a whole bunch of others. But kind of the big point here is there's over 1,100 providers on Windows 10 right now. Um, if you run that command at the bottom on your Windows laptop, that shows you every provider that's available to you right now. Um, so that's kind of like a brief overview of what we can see with it, what it looks like, what, it, what it's able to do. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the kind of the shape of it and what it's like to consume it. Um, this is the top half of a program called Microsoft Message Analyzer. It's free. You can download it yourself. Um, and play with any of the ETW providers that are on the operating system. It's how my team hunts for new data sources. Um, to zoom in a little bit, this is a s series of events that came in from the Microsoft Windows PowerShell. Um, that highlighted fourth line is invoke Mimi Cats, which is just me goofing around. Um, but kind of the point here is that it's a series of events that you listen to, right? It, it's glorified printf debugging um, in, with a schema. This is the bottom half of that program. Um, and so zooming in on the middle portion, the events have different properties. And different providers produce different types of events with different types of schemas. But kind of the big thing here is that you can look at what kind of data they're providing. Um, in this case, the two that are interesting are payload and context info. Um, if we zoomed in on what context info is doing, there's a, the right-hand panel of that program. We can see things like the host application. So if I had been spent a little more time, I could have made this uh, use PS attack, and we would still get the same logging. 
Um, you can see the second highlighted line there is invoke Mimi Cats, and on the, the third highlighted line is my username. So who, wrote, who executed the command, what command was executed, and which host process it came from. We use ETW for all the things now, right? Just turn it all on, let it go, you know, flood the system with information. Now, you've, now you're going to win the day. Except not really. Um, it's a debug stream. It's high volume. It was never meant for security. And so you've got to distill out the most interesting pieces of data for yourself. Um, and so the Windows organization, is, last I checked, is about 5,000 engineers. Imagine 5,000 engineers adding all the debug information they ever wanted to know to 1,100 providers. It's a lot of information. If you were to turn them all on, you wouldn't be able to keep up. It'd probably be writing terabytes a minute. Um, let's see. So let's talk a little bit about basics before we get into the how to consume ETW. Um, Kind of some important terms we got to cover are the trace session is a single session that you can subscribe to events for. Provider is a source like PowerShell or DNS or WMI. And then events are generated by providers. And some of the interesting relationships here are that um, trace sessions can subscribe to one or more providers. So you could turn on all 1100 if you knew what you were doing, but you would be sad. And providers produce the events, and they can produce more than one type of event. There's not a one-to-one -one relationship there. You define your events, and so I think the PowerShell one describes 20 or so. Um, and then some basic properties about ETW itself when you're consuming it. It's user mode. You need to be administrator, but it is a user mode um, pr uh, consumption model. It's low latency, high volume, like I kind of mentioned earlier. The events are schematized, um, but it's not a perfect data source. And I say that in the respect of um, you can drop events the way that the subsystem works. There's a ring buffer. And if you don't pump events off the ring buffer fast enough, you will start dropping the oldest events off the end. Um, and then I mentioned corrupted events. They don't happen often, but I've seen them. Um, I would guesstimate one in every 10 million events is corrupted, so it's pretty good, but it does not have any guarantees that that data is always going to be 100% accurate and no, not uh, corrupted. So there's a couple ways that we can consume ETW. Um, we can go real-time or we can go non-real-time, and we'll start with real-time because I think it's more interesting. Um, there's some native APIs, uh, Win32 event tracing APIs. Um, and then there's Crabs ETW, which is the library that my team released. Um, you might ask, why Crabs? Uh, we were trying to come up with a name for the library, and we didn't want to just say ETW logging listener library, right? Because that would make it impossible to Google for. And for whatever reason, we were talking about it, and I was talking about SpongeBob, and my coworker was like, oh, the Krusty Crab, we'll call it Crabs. So there you go. On the managed side, We've got system.diagnostics.eventing, and that is part of the uh, .NET runtime. Trace event, which is an open source library from Microsoft. Uh, Vance Morrison on the .NET perf team released it. And then Crabs ETW also has a managed wrapper. Um, on the non-real-time side, you've got two phases. You have to capture a trace, and then you need to analyze a trace. And so for capturing, you can use Logman, which is part of the OS. Um, Xperf, which is part of the driver toolkit, and then Microsoft Message Analyzer, which is the tool we talked about earlier, but it can also capture ETL traces. Um, and then once you've got your ETL trace file, um, you can do, you load it up into Windows Performance Analyzer or PerfView. And these scenarios are typically like, you've got a new, brand new laptop, and the power management team wants to understand why it doesn't go into suspend correctly. Well, they would sit there and they'd say, okay, well, we're going to turn on the power management trace. We're going to put the laptop to sleep. We're going to wake it up in five minutes, and then we're going to stop the trace. We're going to replay that trace through one of the uh, ETL view, uh, viewers so that you can see what happened. Again, glorified printf debugging. Um, some people have asked me why they don't just capture ETL files and analyze them on the back end. And the problem there is that there's simply too much information. Um, you have limited ability to filter on the ETL files. So if you turn on a couple of high volume providers, you're gonna generate you know, gigabytes a minute, um, which is not really feasible to take off of a host, especially when the host is serving a web app um, to a customer. In the context of intrusion detection then, we're mostly interested in real time. Um, 
So every ETW subscriber, regardless of whether it's Logman, Xperf, Microsoft Message Analyzer, your own custom role, your own agent, is going to follow the same exact flow. You're going to create a new session. You're going to subscribe to one or more of those providers that you're interested in. You're going to set up a callback, and that callback is um, it's global. So it has to handle every event from every provider, and handling might mean you drop it, or it might mean you extract out a particular piece of information, but it, it, it has to handle them all. Um, you'll start your trace, you process your events, and stop the trace. Nothing revolutionary, nothing really fancy. It's pretty much like every other tracing technology. Um, so ETW made easy. Um, there's some existing solutions that I already kind of talked about. Um, Win32 Event Tracing API, cumber, cumbersome and inflexible, program like it's 1992. Um, System.diagnostics.eventing is unreliable. Uh, we had a lot of crashing issues with it. We don't use it for basically anything anymore because of the problems there. And Trace Event has poor performance, but not CPU performance. It has poor performance in memory, right? If you create a managed object for every object or every event that comes through, and you're processing 400 events per second, you're going to end up with a memory problem eventually. Um, and so that kind of led us to why we built Crab's ETW. Um, it's got a managed and native uh, API, the modern C++ for native. Um, it's intended to be flexible and intuitive, so I'll show you a demo in a second that kind of describes the flow of, um, like, hopefully super logical. I, I'm welcome, or I welcome feedback on that particular point. Uh, high performance and also a goal of reliability, right? So we run this, for example, in SharePoint Online on um, around 100,000 machines and we generate about, generate about seven terabytes of data a day off of these ETW sources. And that's post-filtering a little over 500 billion events um, a day across the environment. So it's, it's doing pretty good. Um, so we'll talk about a DNS lookup example. Um, one thing that's really hard to do on Windows is to find out DNS lookups as they occur. I'm not aware of another source where you can say, hey, what, what DNS lookup occurred and get all the logging for that by default. Um, but there's an ETW stream or a provider that will give you that information. Um, so up there on the, on the number one, we're going to make a filter. We're going to look for two events, 3018 and 3020. Take my word for it that those are interesting. 3018 is cache lookups, and 3020 is the hot lookup. Like you don't have uh, in the WinINet cache. Number two, setting up a callback. Nothing fancy there. Um, that first line with the query is where we're finding out what the domain name was that was fetched. The second line is just us getting what the response was from the DNS server. Um, the third line is us creating an object, a provider object, that represents the subscription to that given provider we think is interesting. And then we add the filter. Um, that filter is per provider. You don't add it on the, the global level. You add it per provider. That way you can filter down each provider um, to the only the things that you care about. And that filtering happens in the native layer, so it never even bubbles up into starting to create managed objects. Um, and then that last one, number four, we just make a trace object um, and enable the provider on it and start your trace and go. Um, here's an example of the data of that program that I just showed you. Um, so at the top there, you see NewYorkTimes.com. That's me. This is me fetching NewYorkTimes.com, and this is a whole a subset of the uh, resolutions that occurred. And so, like there, there's a quadruple A record. Um, or sorry, an A record, quadruple A records there. The type colon five is the C name records for you know their CDNs, their ad um, software, or their uh, AdSense and doubleclick.net, that kind of stuff. Um, right now, I'm not aware of any other way to do this in Windows. So if you know of a way to do it, I'd be happy to talk. Um, the old way we used to do it is scrape the WinINet cache periodically, which is actually kind of disk intensive um, on a big server. So let's revisit the forensic whitelist. Um, so we wanted to know what DNS lookups happened with that bad.exe at the very beginning. Um, we already looked at that just now, right? Microsoft Windows DNS clients is one source you can get that information. What IP addresses we connected to, how much data was transmitted, whether or not it was beaconing. Um, that's the kernel network provider will give us that data. We kind of talked about that a little bit too. DLLs it loaded. 
the image load provider. Um, what threads were created in other processes, the kernel thread provider, WMI operations, WMI provider from the user mode side. Um, PowerShell functions that were called. Again, we saw that in, in the Microsoft Message Analyzer example. Um, and I want to be clear, these will not give you, these are not detections in and of themselves. You will have to process that data a little bit, and it depends on what detection you're trying to build. So this is, these are ingredients as opposed to a detection. Um, the addendum slide has a little bit of information about kernel providers. They're special snowflakes. If you're really, really interested in what that means, come find me afterward. It's kind of, it's dumb. Um, so how can you use ETW in your environment? Grads is open source under the MIT license. We have the, the, both the C++ and managed APIs are available. Um, there are NuGet packages for both. Um, and that link, don't worry, I will have another better link later um, that's a shortened form. PowerShell Method Auditor is a little program I wrote for uh, Daniel Bohannon to play with um, from Mandiant. Um, he was really curious to see how it worked, and I was like, okay, well, here's a sample project. But it also is a pretty good, exam pretty good example of how we detect PowerShell um, method invocation today, um, minus the blacklist. Um, so any questions, uh, you can get, get a hold of me on Twitter or GitHub, and then that top link, aka.ms slash etw, will take, us, take you to the Crabs ETW GitHub page. And aka.ms slash etw demo takes you to the GitHub page for that demo code I showed. Um, any questions, comments? Um, so, for example, our agent that we run in, uh, in Office 365 today has, for SharePoint Online, I want to say, has 15 user mode providers turned on and three kernel mode providers. So that's about 18 providers. Um, the kernel mode providers are their own, are their own thread. Um, we shoot for less than 5% of a single core in CPU usage, and that's generally about where we are with the filtering we do. Um, so, and that's, that's accounting for the numbers I mentioned earlier, 100,000 machines, seven terabytes a day, 500 billion events per, uh, per day. That's all shooting below 5% of, of a single core. Do what? Yeah, we, <laughs> our goal was to never get noticed. Um, the perf team was surprised to find out that we had even deployed this thing. Um, we didn't tell them that we were doing it. It's better to ask for forgiveness than permission. Um, and they said, well, I mean, you stay below 100% of a single core, we don't care. Um, and that's generous. Other groups are not quite so generous in this case. Um, but yeah, as opposed to Sysmon, I don't have numbers for performance on Sysmon. Um, and I've gotten questions like, why use this instead of Sysmon? This is kind of a build your own Sysmon. Um, in our case, we aren't allowed to install Sysmon because a product team doesn't back it. And so VPs, the VP in my group was like, well, you can't install a kernel driver for something that a, v, that a product doesn't get, or a product team does not back, right? Because um, I don't think, I don't think Sysmon's uh, creator wants me to call him up at two in the morning when it causes 16 machines to fall over, right? Any other questions? Daily load? Um, seven terabytes a day across the environment. Um, anything else? Anyone else? There is a separate agent um, that we use that uploads. Um, so the way our agent works is we write our distilled information. Um, so when we consume ETW, we don't generally do a one-for-one -one event generation. What we do is we distill out information we think is interesting. So like we'll do per process net flow. Um, we'll write that event hourly um, per process to the uh, security event log. Uh, 
And then there's another program who is responsible for pushing that data off the box. Um, in the old way, it was directly to our cold storage. In the new way, it goes through kind of actually similar to what um, Sam was talking about in the first talk. It pushes it to something kind of like Kinesis that aggregates it out to the correct endpoints um, so that we can have a hot store as well as a cold storage mechanism. Yeah. Security event log is not impossible to tamper with, but it's relatively difficult that it's kind of noisy to touch it. And so we consider it a good place to write to. Um, we set a limit of two gigabytes. And so, um, and I think our, our uploaders upload every five minutes. So. Yeah, less than 5% of a single core. Um, in production, there are certain roles, um, for example, SQL does a lot of stuff that's very intensive and a lot of network traffic, and so that one sits more at around 10 or 15 percent. Um, but it's, it's an acceptable cost, and the perf team has not come and yelled at, uh, yelled at us yet for any problems. So. Um, VMs are usually, I want to say, eight core. 64 gigs of RAM, that space. P machines are going to be bigger. I mean, they're big, beefy machines. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Cool. Thank you. <laughs>